Amen. You may be seated. I want to talk to you for the next few moments about overcoming the lies we believe. And I would like to stay along the lines of the theme that you are currently in on the subject of winning. How many like to win? Oh, come on. God bless all three of you. How many like to win? I believe winning is important. And I love the topic of winning mainly because I like, I like sports. I like all sports. I like playing all sports. And growing up, I played all kinds of sports. And I never played a sport to lose. Come on. I never went to a, to a game with the attitude that I'm going to lose this game. Right? I always went in with the winner's mentality, with the goal to win, to achieve. Right? But just this year, I learned something new about winning. And I learned that... Sometimes winning is best understood through a season of losing. And I'm not saying that you have to lose in order to experience winning, but I am saying that in those times when you lose, you can find out a lot about who you are. There is a lot to learn from a losing season. And I went through that losing season just this year, my son decided that he wanted to play soccer and you know he was excited I had found this team driving off you know I was driving off the freeway I seen the sign tryouts you know and so I went registered him he tried out he made the team he began to practice you know they have a very intense coach he's on it he was really finding out what position is each player going to play and remember one time they, they 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 asked who wants to be the goalie Isaac's hand went up and, you know, if, you, if you're the goalie, sometimes, you know, they score all the goals on you. Your whole team's looking at you like, what are you doing, you know? So I try to explain that to Isaac. Like, Isaac, are you sure you want to be the goalie? Why don't you be a forward or a midfield? You know, like, I don't know, man. That, that's, good. that's a tough position. He's like, no, I want to be goalie because you were goalie when you were playing, you know, school and, and uh, soccer. And, you know, I just want to I, I, I try it out. I said, all right. I remember we practiced, and then finally spring league came around. And we went into the first game of spring league. I was all excited for my son. You know, I had bought him all the latest gear. Come on, kept him on Nike, Nike, everything. You know, come on, just do it. We're going to win. Winner's mentality. Come on, man. And I remember we went to the first game. I'm checking out the kids. Ah, oh, they don't look that bad. You know, I think we're going to win this. We got this, man. We got a good squad. The game ends and we lost. 6-0, 7-0, I forgot what it was, man, but it was painful. Come on. I said, all right, all right, I get it. It's the first game. They're barely learning how to gel. Chemistry's barely building up, you know. You know, they're just barely learning the game, the system, the tactics, you know. They'll get the next one. Next game came. Oh, let me just say that in the first game, I invited everyone. The second game, I didn't invite nobody. <laughs> I don't want nobody to come right now. Come on. Next game came, and. Same result, we lost. And I said, all right, we got better, though. Kind of got better a little bit. You know, I was trying to pre preach to myself. Come on. <laughs> Third game came, we lost. Fourth game came, we lost. Fifth game came, we lost. Sixth game came, we lost. And it was at that time where my son began to say certain things. He began to say, I can't. He began to say, I don't know if I could do it. He began to say, God, he said, Dad, I don't know if I could play goalie. He began to say, I should just quit. I don't want to go to practice anymore. I don't want to do this anymore. Dad, I don't think I could do it. And it was in that time where I started believing those lies as well. And I started, oh, yeah, maybe he can't. You know, maybe we should just quit right now and go home, you know, while we still got a chance. But then something came over me, and I started to remember that, Come on, the Mesa family are not losers. Come on, somebody. Mesa family are winners. And I remember telling myself, no, no, you know what? We got to turn this around. We got we to, gotta, I, I got I to gotta speak life into him. I got to, I got to, I got to, you know, let him know that everything's going to be okay. I bought, I bought him a soccer goal. I put it in the backyard. I started, to, I started putting him right there. I said, look, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kick this ball so hard, I want you to block it, man. If you block it, you're getting an Xbox 360 game. Come on, you're getting an Xbox One. 
Come on, man. And he started getting, okay, if he started getting all, you know, every time he, that's how he would get me to practice. Like, Dad, if we go practice right now and I block some shots, can you give me something? <laughs> Let's go. Come on. And, and then I, I would shoot out of him and he would be throwing himself and, you know, out there just practicing, trying to get better. Because what happened was in the season of losing, there was a lot of things that we learned. In the season of losing, there were some things that were highlighted that can't be highlighted when you're winning. See, when you're winning, everything's fine. When you're winning, the smallest mistake, oh, I don't worry, we'll get that back, right? Oh, it's all right, don't trip. But when you're losing, the smallest thing begins to be magnified. Somebody messes up, come on, man, be on your game. What are you doing? You're not supposed to be doing that, right? But when you're winning, it's a whole different thing. I remember we finished playing for two months we didn't play no games. We just practiced. We practiced. We practiced. June came along, and tournament season came, and we had our first tournament. And, you know, ner- parents were kind of nervous because, you know, we, we, we've suffered. You know, we've gone through some losses, you know. And, you know, this is, this is the type of league where, you know, if you lose, you know, you're not getting ice cream. Amen? You know, how there's, there's some leagues where if you lose, you're still going to get ice cream, you know. <laughs> Over here is not like that, you know. And I remember we were going to our first tournament. The coach is saying, we're, you know, we, we, the coach is having a meeting. Parents, I want you guys to bring your kids, be there at this time. And I remember one parent, he's like, are you sure we're ready for this tournament? Like, we're just going to go and just, you know, be killed, man. And, and, and the coach is like, no, 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 you know, this is, it's a different team, you know. We, we've been on it. It's been two months. We're going to go. We show up to the tournament. You know, we got mixed feelings. We're, 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 we're kind of like nervous for the kids. We show up and... To all our surprise, they win their first game. <laughs> Come on. And they won convincingly, too. They won like 7-0, you know. And so, you know, we go, we go on to our next, next team, and we win again. Come on, somebody. And then we go to the next team, and we win the game again. Come on. <laughs> then we make it to the finals. Come on, somebody. And we go on to win three tournaments in a row. Come on, somebody. <laughs> The team that we used to be, we no longer are. And we, but, but see, what happened is we learned something through that season of losing. That when you win, after you've been through a season of losing, it's a whole other thing. Come on, somebody. It becomes better, right? Come on, everything, you know, because you've endured a season of losing. And I told my son, you know what, man, you wanted to give up, but you stuck it out. And you did not give up. And you kept training. You kept believing. And look at you, man. Look at you. But we learn a lot. When we have to go through some of those seasons of losing, if we could be honest with each other, we've been in some seasons of losing. We've been in some seasons where, man, things are not going how we want them to go for our lives. We, we've been through some times where, you know, we don't know if we're ever going to step into a season of winning again. But I want you to know not to look at your season as the end, but look at it. How can I get better so when I get into that season of winning, things can be turned around for my life? We, we begin to believe certain lies in a season of losing. We begin to uh, entertain those thoughts and entertain those lies when, when we sometimes feel like there's no uh, uh, wins on our, on our winning column, amen? But I want you to know that God has called us to overcome. God has called us to be more than conquerors, amen? And it's in this season where we just prepare for the next season that God has for our lives, amen? In the season of winning. Genesis chapter 3 speaks to us about three specific areas where the enemy comes and targets his lies. See, he's not looking to come at you for one day or two days. He's coming to look at you for a lifetime. And what happens is he comes at you in one of these three areas to get you to somehow be distracted and, 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 and just... Uh, not reach your full potential, amen? The first area that he comes at us is he comes against our purpose. And the enemy has come against our purpose from the moment we came onto this earth. Because one thing he knows for sure is that if you ever reach your purpose, if you ever get to that place that God has called you, come on, he's going to be in trouble. And so he's always come against our purpose. And the enemy is very crafty. And he's come at us to get us to a place where we believe that we were created by default and not by design. That we were just an accident. That we were just a mistake. Come on, somebody. 
that we weren't supposed to be born, that there was no purpose for our lives, that you could be living something else other than your God-given purpose. He comes against our purpose. And what I've noticed is that when people step into, sometimes they step into a season of losing, it's because they're not living out their God-given purpose. Sometimes we think that we were an accident or we were a mistake. And, you know, that word accident means an unfortunate incident that happens unexpectedly and unintentionally, typically resulting in damage or injury. Growing up, I thought I had no purpose. Growing up, I thought I was a mistake. I thought I was, I, I should have never been born. I should have been aborted. And because of that, my life resulted in damage or injury. Because of the absence of purpose in my life, because I did not have a clear purpose in my life, I was living other things trying to find some type of significance in my life. And the enemy does that early on in our lives. He does that. That's why he fought you so hard. That's why he came against you so much. That's why he's always came against your life because he knows that if he can get you to reach your, your purpose, it's over for him. Throughout life, I've experienced the enemy derail me. I've experienced him try to detach me. I've experienced him try to throw me off my God-given purpose. Amen. Amen. I grew up thinking that I had no purpose. I grew up thinking I was a big mistake. I thought that, you know, God did not have a plan for my life. But one of the reasons I'm so grateful for Victory Outreach is because the moment I stepped foot into that men's home, the moment I stepped into that men's home, it, the first words I heard is God has a purpose for your life. God has a plan for your life. Man, you were not a mistake. You were not an accident or an incident. God has given you a purpose, and it's time that you reach that purpose. Those have been some powerful words I have received in Victory Outreach. That God has a purpose for your life. Man, I remember feeling like, God, uh, why did you save me? God, why did you, you know, deliver me? Why did you bring me into this ministry? It was always because he had a purpose for my life. And it even got deeper when I began to read scriptures like Jeremiah 1.5 where he says, Before you were in your mother's womb, I knew you. Before I created you, I set you apart, man. It was when I read scriptures like Jeremiah 29 verse 11, for I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans to prosper you and, and, and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. He has given us a purpose, amen. And it's in the times when enemy tries to lie. He li tries to lie to tell you, no, 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 no. I've called you for this. No, 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 that's not, what, that's not your God-given purpose. He, he comes against us. Remember reading Psalms 139. And just speaking to my life, amen, for you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb, man. God loves us so much. He, he personally, amen, built us and created us. It says, I praise you and I, because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in a secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. You saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. He created us with purpose. He's given us purpose. And this morning, possibly, you could be stepping into a losing season because you have stepped away from the purpose God has for your life. You've stepped away from that purpose. And there, there, there's two reasons how the enemy comes against our purpose. The first one is that he questions what God has already said. He questions and he gets you to doubt what God has already said about you, what God has already written about you, what God has already promised you, what God has already spoken over your life. The enemy always comes and he poses this question, did God really say that? Did God really say for you to move to San Diego? Come on, somebody. Did God really say for you to be here? Did God really say he would save your family? Did God really say he would heal you? Did God really say he would promise you, right? And the enemy comes against our God-given purpose when he questions what God has already said. God has already called you, man, but the enemy likes to come and, 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 and do other things and lie and, and, and try to somehow get you off your God-given purpose. Because if he can get you off your God-given purpose, man, if he can get you off alignment just a little bit, if he can get you to look at other places and seek other things that you think are his purpose, man, then he's won. Did God really say 
you must not eat from that tree in the garden. And, you know, the enemy, he's so crafty. He presents opportunities for you to make you think that God is holding out somehow. That is the biggest reason why some people confuse uh, God's blessing and the enemy's blessing. See, because God loves you so much, he doesn't give you everything right away. He gives it to you in bits and pieces because he's no, you, he knows you ain't ready. But the enemy comes and he gives it all to you right away. And that's what he was trying to present to Eve. He says, did God really say not to eat from any of the trees? And Eve says, no, that's not what God said. God said you must not eat from the tree in the middle of the garden. But he presents this, this, this question that God had doubts about you. And we have to know as, as Christians, man, God, we have to know what his word says about us. We have to know what his word says we can do. We have to know what his word says we have access to. We have to know what his word says we can become. Come on, somebody. We, are, we need to know that we serve a God that is powerful. And it's, in his word, it's already written. There's no reason why he needs to come and question what God has already said. Sometimes we forget and we doubt. And it's always in a season of losing where we begin to doubt God's plan. Where we begin to say, God, did you really say that? God, did you really speak to me, God? God, I don't know, was that really your voice, man? And if God has already spoken to you, there's no reason for you to ask, God, did you speak to me? All you got to do is say, God, strengthen me so I can get through what I'm facing right now. The second thing that he does is not only does he question what God has already said, but secondly, this is where we see the crafty side of him. He's quick to present something to you that God, God has for you in the future. He, he presents it to you in a way that intrigues you to have it now. You ever wanted something before time? You ever said, no, no, I want it now. Give it to me now. Right? You ever, you, you ever like, really just, you know, come on, you know, you, you picked up the present, you shook it, you went like this, you opened it up a little bit. You want it now, though, right? No, you got to wait. You got to wait. The enemy is so crafty that he comes to you. And he presents something that's supposed to be down in the future for you. He brings it to you today so that what is a blessing will end up being a curse in your life. He's done that to many. I've seen it so many times. Pastor, I got a job. But I have to work Sundays. But I'm going to be able to tithe. And little by little, that job takes him away. Sometimes I've seen, Pastor, uh, I want to see if I can uh, date this person. He loves the Lord. His nose is not that big. He was broken at the altar. She's involved in ministry. It's not time for that right now. And the enemy is so crafty. See, when he, you know, Eve knew that tree was there. But the enemy represented that tree in a way to Eve that got her to, got her to think, got her to see, and got, to, got, got her to start thinking about, hmm, I could benefit from this. I could benefit from this. The Bible says that, the serpent said to her, you will certainly not die. The serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And what I really believe about this tree, I believe God created this tree with a purpose. We don't know what that purpose is. It was yet to be revealed. But because, because they ate from it, we don't see what the purpose of that tree was. And the enemy got Eve to eat from that tree, who God was going to reveal the purpose of that tree later on. And it became a curse for Eve instead of a blessing. The Bible says that when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. And don't we begin to lose when we quickly rush into things that are meant to be a blessing in the future but become a curse when we get in them today? We rush into things. We want it now, right? One of the biggest things in the home, Pastor, I'm ready. I've been in the home for 30 days. I'm ready. I'm ready to go work. 
my uncle's family's, uh, you know, grandpa's uh, business owners, and they're going to hire me, and they're going to pay me 16 bucks an hour, pastor. And I ain't never had a $16 an hour job. Well, let's back up a little bit. You ain't never had a job, period. <laughs> but now you want to go and step into something that I don't think you're ready for. We see that all the time. We step into some things that are supposed to be a blessing down the road. They're supposed to bless our lives. They're supposed to bless our household in the, in the, down the road. But right now, we can't step into that because there's going to be a curse. And we need to learn how to discern that. We need to know when it's God and we need to know when it's the enemy. We need to know when it's just, an, uh, you know, uh, the enemy dressed up as angel of light. Trying to present himself to you. To eventually derail you, to eventually distract you, to eventually get you off your God-given purpose so that you don't reach who God has called you to become. He comes at us like that, amen. We got to know, man, we got to know that if, it, that, 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 that if it's God, it's God. But if it's not God, it's not God. And sometimes we, there, there, there are ways we can, we can, we can find that out. There are, way, there are ways that we can do that because if a blessing takes you off your purpose, then it was never meant to be a blessing. If, if you re go into something that takes you away from God, takes you away from what you're doing for the Lord, then it was never God. Come on, somebody, right? And so we, 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 we see that that's how the enemy comes. He questions what God has already said. He presents something to us that we're not called to step into today. But what happens is when you, what happens when, when you begin to get off your purpose? What happens is, we, we read God, you know, in the story, God, 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 God asks Adam and Eve three questions. The first question that he asks is, where are you? I believe God still asks that question today. See, when you step out of your purpose, you begin to hear, where are you? Just like some people are going to get a text right after church. Where were you? Come on, somebody. <laughs> Tomorrow morning. Where were you, brother? We missed you in church, all right? Sometimes when we step out of our purpose because he's questioned what God has already said or because we've stepped into a blessing that we thought was for today but really was for tomorrow, we step out of our purpose. And what happens is little by little we begin to hide. We hide behind the trees. Come on, somebody. We got to start putting the missing picture, your missing picture, come on, somebody, on the back of a mail carton. <laughs> missing. Last seen at Life Group. <laughs> Last time I spoke to them, they got a new job. God, God asks, where are you? And, and, and God begins to ask them, where are you? And, and, and they get that question because when God went to look for them where they were supposed to be, they were nowhere to be found. They were nowhere to be found in their God-given purpose. And the thing to ask is when we're going through a season of losing, possibly it's because we're off our purpose. So the thing to ask is not why, God, am I going through this trial? Why, God, am I facing hard times? The question to answer is where am I? Where am I, Lord? Answer that question and I guarantee you'll get over it quick. Because if you can say, where am I, God? Okay, I'm in church. I'm connected. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going to life group. I'm giving. I'm doing what I have to do. Then you can say, okay, God, you have me in the right place. I just need to be taught a lesson. But if you say, I'm not coming to church. Where am I? I'm working overtime. Where am I? I'm skipping out on life group. Where am I? I'm sitting in the back. Where am I? I'm watching online right now. Then certainly something's wrong right there. Where are you this morning? Where are you? God is asking, where are you? Are you in your God-given purpose? Are you walking out what God has called you to walk out? Are you stepping into what God has for your life? Where are you? And some of you are answering, I'm right here, but you should have been in New York. Because that was what, that's where God wanted to take you, to grow you. Come on. See, when you're out of, when you're out, when you're out of sync, when you're not walking in your purpose, man. You're missing out on a lot of things. And so we see that the enemy comes against our purpose. 
And has he, has he, has he, hasn't he came at our purpose, man? He's, he's trying to get us off course. He's trying to stop us from, 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 from becoming what God ha- wants us to become. And he did that to Adam and Eve when he came at their purpose. The second thing is that he not only comes against our purpose, but he, can, he comes at our potential. He comes at our potential. When we talk about potential, potential is what could be. The possibilities of becoming. That's why when Jesus was a baby, they wanted to kill him. Because of the potential that was in him. Because of what he was going to become, right? Because of what he was going to represent for the world, right? And the enemy looks, if he can't get you to lose your purpose, he gets you to not understand the potential he's placed in your life. He gets you to not be able to see that God has placed great potential in your life. When we involve God, man, the possibilities become endless. God has great possibilities, and God has given us the potential to become. Not only has he given us a purpose, but he's given us what we need inside to become the men and women God has called us to become. God has created us for purpose. What we read in in, in Genesis chapter 3 is that when God came looking for them, he said, where are you? And this is what they answered. They said, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid. The second question that God asked them is, who told you that you were naked? Who told you that you were naked? See, because when God created Adam and Eve, he created them not to know that naked and bare was something bad. He he created them with no shame. He created them with with no fear, right? And and, and he created them to think that, uh, to to believe that how he created them was the perfect way. But when God asked them, who told you you were naked? What God was asking Adam, he was asking him, who told you you were something I never created you to be? Who told you that you were that? I've never created you like that. That word was not even in my vocabulary. I did not know you, you know, created you to be bare, to be with nothing, to be without, to be with lack. I created you with abundance. I created you with everything that you needed. It was a good day when I created you. But the enemy gets us to believe that we need to walk around life with some of these. You got big fig leaves, huh? Oh, I wonder who first ran to these, was it Adam or Eve? <laughs> Either way, they were the first fashion designers, amen? <laughs> they recognized they were naked, and they got some fig leaves. And I wonder how many in church are walking around with fig leaves right now. <laughs> because they don't understand their potential. Because they don't understand that God didn't create them naked. God didn't, God, God didn't create you to understand that you were naked. He, he created you with everything. He created you lacking nothing. Come on, somebody. And sometimes we fall into that, you know, trap where we say, yeah, I'll never amount to nothing. I'll never become that. I'll never become this. I, I'm always a failure. I don't know why I can't do it. I don't know why I can't ever succeed. I don't know why I can't be like that sister, man. She's always blessed. I don't know why I can't be like that. That brother's always smiling, man. He looks like he never goes to trials, and he's always blessed, man. And he just posted the other day that he got blessed with a new job and a new car, and God is blessing his life. But why isn't he blessing mine? And we can quickly fall into the trap of believing that what they are receiving, we are not qualified for. But that is not the case. God loves us just the same. There is just, might be a further down the road or they you know, might be in another season as you are, amen. But nonetheless, that is also available for you. You are also qualified to receive that. All you got to do is realize there is potential in me to become everything God's called me to be. See, he comes against our potential. When I had to encourage my son, man, I had to, I had to pump life into him. I found, a, I found a little nine-year-old on YouTube that's a goalie, great goalie. And I said, look, Isaac, watch this video. And it's like 11 minutes, man. And he, was, he always watches that video. And he, he did it like this. And he did it like that. And I said, look, you can become that. 
you can become that. All it takes is training. All, he, he's the same size as you. He's got the same capabilities as you. Why can't you become like that? You can. You just got to stick it out. You got to train harder. You got to have the faith to believe that you are going to step into your, your potential. God's placed potential in our lives. How many can say amen? God, you know, everything the Bible speaks about creation, when the Bible speaks about creation, man, you, you re- when you really read about the universe and when you really read about the stars and the planets and how, you know, the sun is just the right distance for us not to burn up here on earth and how he created our being, our systems and our eyes and our organs and everything that he created, man. But then the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2 that we are his masterpiece. That means that, yeah, he took time to think about how to create the universe and the, and the stars and everything. But when he created us, he did not create us and they say, oh, man, I don't know. I wonder what's going to happen with them. No, he created us already with potential. He already saw what our ending was going to be like. He already saw what he had placed inside of us. And we got to start believing that. You know, sometimes I know in a season you could be, God, I don't know if you call me. I don't know if I have a purpose but that's not the way God created you. He didn't create you and then think, man, I wonder if they're ever going to live up to their potential. Oh, I wonder if they could ever uh, amount to anything. No, God already knew you would. We just got to believe it. And sometimes the reason why we don't overcome is because we're believing the lies that we will never amount to anything. God God did not design Adam and Eve to be bare, to be without, to be less than. He didn't, des- de- he didn't design them to hide. He didn't design them so that they could uh, be fashion designers and put on some fig leaves. Come on. He didn't design them to be afraid. No, he designed them with potential. He designed them with power inside of them. Amen. The Bible says the same spirit that raised Jesus is the same spirit that dwells within you and me. Come on, somebody. That is power. That is potential. That is power right there. So he comes against our potential. He tries to to stop us. And we as a people of God, man, we have to understand that there is a process to our development. There is a process to to our development. And at times our potential is going to be realized, but, you know, we serve a God of more. And he wants more out of you. And he wants more out of you, right? And he wants more out of you. I keep using this illustration with my son, but, man, I was just sitting there Writing down a sermon when we were going through this losing season, amen, and so <laughs> got a lot of notes, amen. But the coach, you know, when we started winning, I, I started seeing, you know, we were winning 6-0, and the coach would be like, I want more. And the parents would be like, why does he want more? We're winning. <laughs> Sometimes that's how, that's how God is. He, wa- he knows there's more inside of us. He wants to draw the more out of us. There is more potential in there. Come on, we have not arrived. We're still trying to reach more and more for the Lord. Amen. And so, you know, we have to understand that there's a development to that process. The last thing that the enemy comes against, and, you know, he comes against our purpose. He comes against our potential. But thirdly and lastly, and the worship team can make the way, is that he comes against our perspective. You know, all these that I'm saying, purpose, potential, perspective, are really um, what I believe to be uh, root um, things that he comes against. Because he, he, he doesn't want to just keep you off track for a few days. He wants to go after your whole life. And so if he can come after your purpose, if he can get you to believe that you, you were created for something else other than for God then he's one. If he can get you to believe that there is no potential inside of you, then you'll never become what God has called you to become. But if he can get you to see things not through the lens of God, then he could get you to be off course all your life. One of the greatest experiences I've had was when I got glasses. Come on. Like right now, I can't see you guys. It's just just like little balls of fuzz, you know. (laughs) For a long time, this is how I operated. I drove like this. I wasn't ever on a motorcycle like this because I already had a motorcycle at the time. But imagine. (laughs) 
And I remember, like, it would get scary because at night I really can't see. And I was driving like that. Some of you drive crazy with glasses. Amen. Imagine if you didn't have glasses. I found myself having to squint, you know, having to squint. I couldn't see. And so finally, I uh, I humbled myself and went to the eye doctor. Amen. I didn't want glasses, you know, fighting it. And when I got there, I sat on the chair and the doctor began to do his work. And he's like, tell me if you could see. Give me a one or two. What do you see better? You know, all that. I was like, I don't see none of them. (laughs) He's like, oh, and then he's like, you drove here, right? I said, no. He's like, brother, you're alive by the grace of God. He's like, you're blind. So he gave me my prescription, told me to come back in two weeks, pick him up. Came back, picked him up. And the moment I put my glasses on, it was a whole nother world. I walked out of the the eye doctor. Every car I saw had a shine to it. Brand new, looked brand new. At the time, I was driving a 1988 Honda Accord hatchback. It looked brand new to me. I was like, man, I'm driving this? Wow, it's tight, man. Every single, I'm not lying, every single car just looked brand new to me. I got on the freeway and I started noticing things that I never knew were there. I was like, there's the in and out right there. I was like, oh, there's a McDonald's right there. I started noticing things. I'm like, whoa, there's a mall right there? I never knew there was a mall right there. They just put that one up or what? I started seeing things differently. My driving became safe on somebody. I could see from far away. Before I had to be like, the TV is right there, like this, watching TV. I could be laying down now, come on somebody. Things changed for me. My perspective was off. And what was crazy about that is that my, my perspective was off. And I didn't even know it. I didn't even realize it. I'd be driving down the 5 freeway. I didn't even see the ocean right there. I'd be driving through different, I didn't notice, I didn't notice nothing. But the moment I got some perspective was the moment I began to see farther. I began to see details. I began to see clearer what God had for me. And What I've learned about perspective is that the enemy really comes against our perspective. Because if he can get you to see things in the natural, if he can get you to see things not like how he sees them, not with the eyes of faith, not seeing them through his word, come on, that's how we experience a lot of losses. The third question that God asks. He asks them, if we read about it in verse 13. The Bible says that the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? What have you done? And what happened was God came. He didn't find them. They were hiding. He says, where are you? Adam says, I was hiding because I was afraid and I was was naked. And God says, who told you you were naked? Did you eat from the tree I command you not to eat from? What 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 did Adam do? She ate it. Come on, husbands, how many still do that? Then God looks at Eve and says, what is it you have done? And Eve says, the serpent. And what happens is 
if you ever want to find out where your perspective's at, you find out where your perspective at, is at when you get asked that question, what did you do? And so many times our perspective is off and we're blaming everybody else for why we're not where we need to be. We're blaming everyone else why we're not succeeding, why we're not winning. Well, if only she would have did this, we wouldn't be in this place. Well, if only he would have did that. And what happens is because our perspective is off, we go around blaming others why we can't succeed, why we can't win. He says, what is it you have done? The reason why sometimes we don't win is because our perspective, our outlook towards the dealings of God are not where it needs to be. And it's at this time where possibly we've taken on a victim's perspective rather than a victor's perspective. See, because when victims lose, they blame others, right? They blame others quick. When victors lose, they look to, be, to get better. They train harder. When victims lose, they take their ball home. Come on, somebody. I shared a story in the first service about I had a friend, a white friend in the neighborhood. His name was Bobby. He had the only football in the neighborhood. So if we wanted to play football, we had to keep Bobby happy. So when it was time to pick, Bobby would always get picked first. The only thing with Bobby is that Bobby wasn't good. So sometimes he wouldn't get the ball. And when he wouldn't get the ball, he'd pick up his ball and he'd be like, I'm going home. Sometimes that's how when you have a victim's perspective, that's how you are. You go to another church. You go to another life group. You go to another ministry. Some of you right now are going to abandon whatever team is in fifth place. And you're going to go to Pastor Aldo's team. Like, Pastor Aldo, I'm on your team. Sister Tracy, can you transfer my money over to Pastor Aldo's team? The hungry lions are starving right now. They haven't ate. Come on, somebody. We can't take our ball home, man, when we're not loot, we're not winning. We can't give up and quit when things are not going our way. We need to have that winner's perspective and know that although we're losing, God is doing something in the midst of our losing. When victims lose, they walk around mad at the world. Possibly there's someone here right now, you are blaming somebody why you're not where you need to be and that person don't even know they're blamed. When victors lose, they understand that although they lost today, tomorrow is coming with a new set of opportunities to win again. Come on, give Jesus a big hand for that. Come on, he's called us to be more than conquerors. He's called us to be champions. He's called us to be winners. He's called us to rise up above what we may be going through right now, the circumstances of losing. He's called us to rise up and to step into that purpose, step into that potential, step into that perspective. Because we're more than winners. Come on, lift your hands right there where you're at. Come on, lift your hands. Come on, I believe God wants to raise up some winners in the house. But you might be in a season of losing today. Come on, you might not be in that season where you feel like that you're winning. But just change your attitude, change your mentality. Oh, come on, if this word spoke to you, I want you to come to the front here this morning. Let's spend some time in the presence of the Lord. Hallelujah.